you know, you do end up going into C++ once you're on the embedded devices, but I've been very interested by MicroPython and CircuitPython even. Um, you know, it would be, uh, we have, I know there are some community members working on the open source side of TensorFlow like Micro who have been trying to support CircuitPython and MicroPython. Um, and yeah, it would be fantastic if we could actually have, um, you know, an accessible language like Python all the way through. You can generally, because you're training small models, you don't generally need like, you know, a hundred GPU machines in order to train these models since they're pretty small. It almost feels like the like early 1980s with home computers and people know that there's something exciting. I want to start the podcast not, not with an intro from you, We'll come to that in a moment, but from a quote from the Tiny Machine Learning book that you and Daniel Sitayanaka wrote, which is about tiny machine learning, saying, simple algorithms running on tiny computers made from sand, metal and plastic can embody a fragment of human understanding. This is the essence of tiny machine learning, a term that Pete coined. So today we have Pete on our show, on the podcast. I'm very delighted to have you on the show, Pete. Welcome. No, thank you so much for having me, Josef. Yeah, that's great. So maybe if people don't know who Pete is, what you're actually doing, what you worked on, because you have plenty of experience, can you give us like a one or two minute quick bio? Who is Pete and what, what have you been working on and currently work on? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I um, came to Google through a startup uh, that I was CTO of uh, that got acquired back in uh, 2014. Um, and what we were trying to do there was take all the billions of photos that people put out in public and kind of analyze them to sort of produce a Yelp that was based on people's uh, photos. And so figuring out, you know, where hipsters hung out by looking for mustaches uh, <laughs> at the time in bars, uh, like figuring out which places were dog friendly by um, noticing uh, where dogs were and things like that. And what was interesting was um, that was around the time when computer vision was actually starting to work. Um, and I was experienced with all the old tools of doing computer vision, like, you know, you're looking for a red eye in photos, so you, you write a program to go through and look for little red circles in the image, and you have all these rules about, you know, they have to be next to each other and all this sort of stuff. Um, and I noticed, you know, back in 20. 10, 2011, that all of um, these new deep learning techniques were so much better than what we had been doing. So we ended up focusing and putting out a bunch of open source tools around using deep learning for computer vision. Um, and that's really what grabbed me and that's what got Google interested. And, and really that's what I've been working on ever since um, is trying to produce better open source tools around machine learning. That's so, so exciting. And um, there's also a story or anecdote be behind the OK Google um, sentence. I, I, you shouldn't maybe say it because you have an Android phone next to you and I have an iPhone, <laughs> so that's my advantage right now. Um, but maybe you can tell us a bit uh, of a backstory from this OK Google and how it came into, fell into place. Um, and what's the idea behind this uh, embedded machine learning slash tiny machine learning? Yeah, so when I joined Google in 2014, I was feeling quite, um, you know, proud of what we built. We managed to get like machine learning image recognition models down to like a couple of megabytes so that they would fit nicely on a, uh, you know, Android or an, uh, or an iPhone um, app. And then I started, you know, one of the best things about joining Google was meeting all of these teams who were doing really interesting work. And one of them was the, uh, and we actually, in meetings, we tend to call it the OKG team because <laughs> otherwise everyone's phones go off. Um, but I met up with, uh, it was actually Raziel Alvarez, uh, who's uh, these days is now at Facebook, still working on embedded machine learning. But at the time he was working on OKG and he was like, oh yeah, we've got a 13 kilobyte model that we use to recognize OKG. And that just like blew my mind. It's like, 
a model that small can actually be useful. Um, and also, you know, this was a pretty experienced team. They weren't just following, um, you know, some fad. They'd actually spent a lot of time testing different techniques, had a lot of experience with all of the other techniques that you can use, and they had settled on using a deep learning model um, for this, even this really small use case. And that that stuck with me. That really got me thinking, okay, wow, if you can solve this one really important problem of recognizing a wake word um, using a really small model that had to run, and it was really small because it had to run always on your phone without draining the battery. So it had to run on a really uh, low power DSP with very little memory. If you can solve that problem with deep learning, I wonder what other related kind of sensor problems you can actually solve. And so for the first couple of years at Google, I worked on iOS and Android machine learning, but I managed to kick off a research project to try and explore what else we could do around these really, really small networks on embedded hardware. And that's really what became TensorFlow Lite Micro. Yeah, this is so exciting. The way you explain it, like how the history of, of all, like how it began, it's like very, very incredible and very interesting to hear. Like you mentioned 13 kilobytes. Like I imagine when I write like a script or like a deep learning model, that's way bigger than 13 kilobytes. I would like to understand what's happening under the hood. Like how, how much do you take away from these big models? How does it work like in translating such a big model to a smaller one? What's happening behind the scenes? So... Uh, what's interesting about this process, and this is something we um, we see being pretty common, is um, that you end up with often a cascade of machine learning models. So the really small model is kind of like a gatekeeper. It's saying, hey, I think somebody might have said OKG. So it doesn't have to be super, super accurate because what it does is it says, oh, I think I heard something that sounded a bit like OKG. I will wake up the main CPU, which burns a lot, a lot more power, and actually run like a several hundred kilobyte model mm. to verify that it was actually um, the phrase I was expecting. Um, so, and often in a lot of circumstances when you're power constrained, it lets you duty cycle like this because you can have kind of a rough and ready, very small model that doesn't have to be 100% accurate. It just has to really do a good enough job of spotting potential candidates. And then it can wake up the more power hungry, the more capable processor um, and do something or you know transmit you know, a radio signal, you know, the data to some cloud instance or do something that's um, can be more accurate and can kind of have a, you know, this kind of cascaded system of, um, you know, low power that runs all the time and then something that's like higher power that's woken up and, you know, possibly even, you know, a couple of levels of that. Mm -hmm. I would assume you've also like put a ton of work in like the low level language kind of things, like how to optimize it and um, save a lot of power when it comes to like power consumption and CPU usage. But then when I have the tiny machine learning book, which is next to me, like everything you, the examples we work with are based on Python, which is very, very simple to like super accessible. Yeah. And I have to say, um, you know, you do end up going into C++ once you're on the embedded devices. But I've been very interested by MicroPython and CircuitPython even. Um, you know, it would be, uh, we ha I know there are some community members working on the open source side of TensorFlow like Micro who have been trying to support CircuitPython and MicroPython. Um, and yeah, it would be fantastic if we could actually have, um, you know, an accessible language like Python all the way through. Yeah, the, 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 let's see what the future brings. So when it comes to t tiny machine learning in general, what's the main the main principles behind this? For example, you could use it for, let's say, um, to detect if someone is walking past your house, for example. It would be like a, like a movement detector. 
and you have like plenty of options what you can do like use an arduino any kind of microcontroller and put your machine learning model on it like where does it end like what can you do with a tiny machine learning <laughs> maybe you can give us some insights yeah so what's been really exciting is it almost feels like the like early 1980s with home computers and people know that there's something exciting you know there's new capabilities but like nobody's um quite sure what you're going to be you know what the killer app is yet and you know i remember back in the you know i'm old enough to remember back here you know as a little kid back in the early 1980s where people were like putting their recipes onto like you know commodore 64s or putting their address books onto commodore 64s and then like saving them on tape and it you know and it, it was very unclear what you know what you know they they were game machines they were things that people would play with for fun but it wasn't clear what the key use cases were and it feels a lot like that with uh, you know tiny ml at the moment in that there's a whole bunch of geeks who are super excited about this, you know, kind of like the homebrew computer club or something. And we have some use cases, um, but what's really cool is that a lot of the use cases are only now starting to emerge. Like one of my favorites is actually, um, there's a project that uses TensorFlow Lite Micro to take a little ESP32 powered camera and stick it looking at a water meter. And it's actually able to read using computer vision all of these analog dials and these sort of you know numerical displays that are uh, ticking over. Um, so that I would never have thought of, but you know once I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, no, that's a super low cost, low maintenance way of turning all of these billions of you know things that are out there in the world, you know, water meters, gas meters even things on, you know, chemical plants where there's dials and um, all of these displays that would be really expensive and hard to turn into digital, like online modern uh, versions if you actually had to replace the whole thing with some, uh, you know, electronic version. But if you can just kind of retrofit using this, um, you know, real world equivalent of screen scraping basically um to uh turn these analog dials into digital versions that that seems like super clever and like it will have a lot of real world applications yeah i think that makes a ton of sense and i think something like tiny machine can really disrupt in several industries especially when it comes to like things like predictive maintenance um and bigger industries chemistry or things that you mentioned i think that makes a ton of sense um Apart from the power consumption aspect and like the, the size of the model, like are there any other advantages tiny machine learning brings? Yeah, so um, one of my favorite advantages is that it's super cheap. Um, you can generally, because you're training small models, you don't generally need like, you know, 100 GPU machines in order to train these models since they're pretty small. Um, the actual hardware itself is usually below $50 sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like the Raspberry Pi Pico is like, you know, $3. Um, and so you, and you can imagine that's at retail prices. So once you start buying in bulk, you're looking at um, a lot of these chips you can actually get for below $1. Um, so you have this um, incredible availability and this possibility to, um, once you're getting into that range, anything that's got like a switch or a button, uh, you could imagine um, replace, you know, being able to augment those with simple voice interfaces. Um, because, you know, once things are down to, you know, below a dollar, you're starting to look at being able to put them into consumer devices without the price getting exorbitant. Um, and the fact that these things are quite hardy. Um, you know, embedded hardware is really designed to be uh, kicked around and, you know, go through some really tough environments. Um, so you can actually, especially if you have battery power or like solar power or something like that, you can start to put these devices out in the world in places that, um, you know, in fields, 
um, in wildlife tracking, um, in harsh environments um, that you wouldn't uh, necessarily think about putting, a, you know, a laptop or a phone. So, um, yeah, it feels like instead of being sheltered, um, you know, in our homes and in these very carefully um, uh, curated environments where we have all our computers at the moment, it's like sending them out into the world. Yeah, that's so exciting. And you also talked about data a few seconds ago. Like, is there any type of restriction when it comes to data? We have like audio, text. I mean, okay, well, audio is also speech. Is there any like restriction in form of data which you can input to these models? So one question I actually get asked a lot is, uh, you know, should I be using machine learning at all? Should I be using uh, traditional machine learning like random forests and uh, things like that? Um, and uh, my rule, you know, the way I think about it is if you have something that you can express clear rules for, you can just write that as a program. You don't usually need machine learning if you, if there are like, you know, pretty straightforward rules that you can uh, come up with. Um, if you're dealing with something like the structured data, you know, like you've got a temperature sensor or you've got, um, you know, some very, uh, you know, signal that's, uh, you know, very um, clean, then you can probably use like traditional machine learning, random forests and all of those sorts of approaches. But where the deep learning approach really uh, shines is when you've got really unstructured, messy, chaotic data like, you know, images, uh, like audio, like accelerometer data, um, where you've just got loads of noise. You're really trying to, like, look for, you want something that's able to look for patterns despite this very... Um, uh, challenging kind of set of, you know, all these overlapping things in there that um, make it very, very hard to deal with using traditional techniques. So basically, if you can use something else effectively, do. Um, but deep learning really opens up um, a whole bunch of uh, kinds of noisy sensor data that you wouldn't otherwise be able to make sense of. I see. Yeah, but also let's talk a little bit about the book itself because neural networks are some kind of function approximators, we could say. So you start with an example like approximating a sine wave, I think, in the book. But what are other projects that people can expect when they get their book and delve into the beautiful film of tiny machine learning? So when me and Dan uh, thought about this book, we really started off first with the examples that we wanted to show people and then sort of tried to build everything else around there. Um, so what after, like you say, we start off with this kind of hello world example of, hey, let's just model a sine wave so that we can have the equivalent of, um, you know, the blinky kind of example that like everybody has on as their first example for embedded boards. But once we get that uh, done, we then try and focus on uh, first audio. Uh, so trying to do a simple, um, pretty crude uh, recognition of a couple of words. So uh, looking for yes, no, um, in this case. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a good introduction to a bunch of the stuff you have to think about around audio, like uh, feature generation, for example, you actually, uh, in this case, you're not running the neural network model just on the raw PCM sample data. You're actually using FFTs and turning the um, audio into spectrograms before you do the recognition. So there's, um, you know, a bunch of explanation of what we do around that. Um, then we move on to uh, using the accelerometer um, and actually trying to recognize uh, hand gestures, doing sort of a magic wand um, uh, example. Um, and after that, we focus on uh, image recognition. So using um, a low power camera um, attached to an Arduino or some other board and actually trying to tell, hey, is there a person in the image or not? Because by far, that's the most common 
use case of um, image recognition that we found um, for embedded teams is you often need something like a TV or some other device to maybe like wake up its UI, wake up its high power um, UI if it thinks that there's there might be a person um, kind of getting ready to interact with it. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, maybe when I think about like using tiny machine learning for for actually movement detection, let's say in your house, this could also be closely related to the privacy issue because you maybe don't want to have like a bigger deep learning model, which is maybe sent to a server that you have no idea about, but maybe you have your own application at home that it's running locally on your own device. How do you see the privacy issue? Because I think privacy engineering is a relatively new field, right? How do you see the privacy aspect of, uh, of tiny machine learning? And this is actually something that I'm, um, you know, I, I'm pretty concerned about. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I've actually got a white paper uh, that I worked on um, that tries to lay out a hardware architecture where um, the raw recorded audio or image data is actually partitioned on a secure enclave and only a trusted machine learning model ever gets to see the raw data and all the rest of the chip can access is the result of that machine learning model. So is there a person there or not? Or did somebody say a particular keyword? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll share a link to that, um, you know, after the, um, after the podcast. Um, so we might be able to put it in the description or something. Um, but I see that really as uh, it's, it's one of the really promising things about this tiny machine learning side is that you really can do a lot of things like, um, you know, audio, full speech recognition uh, locally on device um, without having to send any of uh, your data to the cloud. Um, and uh, it's really great having that option. Um, and uh, anything that we can do to kind of, um, you know, one of the things I, I, like the idea of is actually devices that don't even have a networking capability, like don't have radio built in, because then you've essentially air-gapped them, mm. um, you know, uh, in a very um, effective way. And if you could have a device like that that's able to do full speech recognition, um, that's obviously going to be super useful. The same goes for, um, you know, detecting if people are around. Um, if you can actually have that be in a device that doesn't even have a radio and you just use it as part of a larger system, um, you know, that, that obviously um, reduces the attack surface um, for a lot of these uh, privacy issues. So, Yeah, this is very interesting. And I think everyone interested in this tiny machine learning topic should definitely get your and Daniel's book. I really recommend it. Like we talked about hardware and software, like what kind of how can people get started? What kind of software do they need and what kind type of hardware? Maybe the cheapest one you can think of. Yeah, so um, the there's a lot of different strengths for all of the different boards. I, I love I love all my boards equally. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not gonna play favorites, but you know, I've got a I've got a few here on my desk. Um, one of the ones that the book is actually built around is this uh, Arduino Nano since BLE 33 um, and uh, it's not the lowest power board and it's not the cheapest but it does have all of the sensors or well almost all of the sensors apart from the uh, camera uh, already built in so it has a microphone and it has an IMU um, like kind of ready to go and fully supported from software um, so you don't have to like I'm terrible at soldering so <laughs> I like the fact that I don't have to breadboard or do any kind of soldering to um, get a lot of stuff up and running on this. And this is, I think it's about like $35 or $40 um, for, the whole, uh, for the whole thing. Um, the ESP32, um, you know, that family is another great option. There's a lot of uh, different um, hardware that you can actually uh, pick up that's using this. Um, 
it's uh, got a really like rich ecosystem, um, and we uh, fully support um, that. Though I don't think that we necess- I don't think we cover that in the book. But you can find um, a lot of um, examples have been converted over to the ESP32. Um, the Raspberry Pi Pico um, is uh, really nice because it's um, it. It's very uh, common now, like a lot of people have done work on it. It really is like the base chip is super cheap, you know, $3. Uh, that's that's a price that's um, kind of hard to beat. Um, it doesn't come with uh, a microphone or an IMU kind of built in, but you can buy um, from, uh, you know, SparkFun or Adafruit or a lot of these other um, teams have actually put together boards um, that have different hardware um, kind of wired in. Um, and uh, there's also uh, SparkFun actually have a nice low-power coin battery-powered board, uh, which... Um, I worked with them on a, a few years ago, and that's really nice because it's got um, that ability to just run off a coin battery, which is one of the uh, key things that I wanted to be able to sort of demonstrate is that this is, you know, you can't do that with a standard. Because one of the questions I often get is like, oh, can I just use a Raspberry Pi? Um, you know, a standard Raspberry Pi, and I'm yeah, yeah. If you've if you've got the power, like if you're able to, you know, it's essentially very similar to a mobile phone um, CPU that's in there. So you kind of need a mobile phone battery, and it will last for about a day on like a, you know, a mobile phone sized lipo. So if that works for your application, or if you're able to plug into the mains power, then definitely go, kind of go ahead and use the Raspberry Pi. But what's really different about these devices is that they can actually run on much, much lower power. So having a coin battery board was a nice way of kind of demonstrating that. That's so cool. And deployment-wise, when we talk about software now, how easy is it or how difficult, quote-unquote, is it to deploy your model onto the embedded system? So uh, what we've tried to do is have examples that work with whatever the native build system for these particular boards is. So, you know, we have an Arduino library for the Arduino. So getting started on that is as straightforward as going to the library manager, looking for uh, Arduino TensorFlow Lite and installing the library. And then you just go to file examples Arduino TensorFlow Lite and pick one of the examples and just upload it to the board. Um, and the same thing goes for like the ESP32 um, and the Raspberry Pi um, Pico um, devices. There's examples that work within their um, standard build systems. Um, and then there's a question of, okay, I want to train my own model. Then you sort of have to go back to Python and we have like Colab notebooks, mm-hmm. um, which I, I quite like as a way of being able to quickly use Python scripts online, uh, where you can first off train the standard model that's, you know, using the, uh, you know, reproduce what we've kind of packaged up in these examples. And then hopefully you can start sort of changing the data or changing the architecture or kind of iteratively kind of making um, adjustments to what kind of ships by default um, to uh, understand more about what's going on. I see. That's so interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Pete. Um, Humans are known for thinking in a linear manner, but of course we kind of think like in an exponential way. But what do you think or what do you hope that tiny machine learning will be like in maybe five to ten years? What is the vision for you? So I really like this idea of, um, I think Microsoft has, have talked about this a lot, but um, ambient computing where... In kind of, and they talk about it in these kind of phases of computing. Like the first phase was 
mainframe computing where there was a, a, well there were a few kind of large computers where people would actually bring their work to the computer feed it in wait for something to happen and kind of then like get the results um and then we changed and went to this world of personal computing where um you know first off we had computers in the home and then we started carrying like laptops around with us and then we started carrying uh phones around with us and so we have these uh computers that um we uh we carry around with us but the idea behind ambient computing is that there will be computers all around you know the environment kind of ready for us when we kind of roll up and uh you know need need something from them or even when we're not there um so uh and that they can cooperate with each other and you know for example um you know being able to uh one of the things i would really love to have is instead of having wake words um be able to just like look at a lamp and say off and have uh you know in that case um image recognition on the lamp itself noticing that oh somebody's looking at me and then using voice recognition to actually detect the you know the the word um versus you know and that feels like a much more natural interaction and it doesn't necessarily need any um the other thing i like is it doesn't need it necessarily need any internet or radio connection to be able to do that you could imagine a device which just has a little kind of always on camera plus um a microphone and it's able to do all of that just as a kind of a little black box um that works like a a little sensor um and really like thinking about ambient computing both for those sort of personal use cases but also having a whole bunch of sensors in a field and being able to detect oh there's like uh pests or there's crop diseases kind of using image recognition um and actually help farmers do a better job of applying you know reducing the amount of chemicals they use or increasing the amount of food that they can actually grow um and yeah this idea of computing being kind of in the world around us versus something that we sort of carry uh, close to our chest so yeah I like the vision I'm really really excited to see what what the future brings and um maybe not talking about machine learning per se maybe like tiny ml is there like some misconceptions that you heard of where you would say okay maybe this is like one of the biggest misconceptions but doesn't actually make sense if you get what i mean yeah no that's um yeah that's that is uh yeah that's that's an interesting question mostly because i actually haven't run across too many misconceptions mostly because people are only starting to kind of learn about tiny ml um uh i guess one of the biggest misconceptions that i had um coming into this was that machine learning and deep learning especially was really only accessible if you had um you know a big data center and you were willing to spend like you know tens of thousands or hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh gpu training um and that's true for a lot of kind of the the cloud side ml research um that gets a lot of um you know a lot of coverage but there's this whole world of very very useful um machine learning that you can do uh, pretty much for free like using Co Google Colab Python notebooks you actually get access to a GPU instance and you can do um you know you can train uh, i think for up to like 10 hours um on that gpu instance so you can actually get um a fair number of models uh nicely uh nicely trained um and you don't have to uh be kind of you know a big organization that can afford uh, all of these resources you really can um and you can actually do really interesting research even 
um, because this field is so young on what is kind of pretty much a, you know, a non-existent budget. Um, there's been some great work um, on network architecture search, for example, by uh, Matthew Matino and some of the ARM uh, research teams. Um, and they don't do the sort of, usually network architecture search requires running all of these different networks um, and training lots and lots of networks and using, you know, millions of dollars of kind of GPU or CPU time. Um, and they've shown some really interesting ways to do network architecture search for tiny ML in a much, much, uh, you know, in a much, much cheaper and more resource efficient way. Um, so I guess that's one of the biggest misconceptions around like kind of machine learning in general is that it's this kind of game that you can only play if you have all of these resources. Whereas um, there are so many really interesting things you can do just kind of, you know, pretty much uh, for free. Yeah. What a time to be alive. It's so exciting. Um, before we wrap things up, is there maybe any closing remarks from your side, Pete, where you would um, like to tell the audience maybe something or something that we didn't cover, what, what you actually want to convey to the audience? Anything from your side, Pete? So really, um, you know, what gets me excited and gets me up in the morning is all of the things that people are building using this technology. Uh, like I said, it's this really exciting time where a lot of people are able to see, oh, wow, this technology has all this promise. Uh, there are all these different things we could do with it, but nobody really knows what the killer applications are. Like, what's going to be the, uh, you know, the most important uses of this? Um, so I love seeing um, the kinds of things that people build um, using this tiny ML approach. Um, and I'm on Twitter as uh, just Pete Warden. Um, if you have uh, stuff to share, um, you know, just tag me um, and, you know, hashtag tinyml um, uh, there. And I would love to see uh, the sort of things that people are kind of experimenting with and building uh, because that's that's really exciting to me. That's so cool. Yeah, to everyone listening to this podcast, you hit it now from Pete. So get your hands dirty, get the book and get started using tinyml on your microcontroller. With that being said, Pete, thank you so much. I learned a lot during this podcast and I hope it helps people around the world delving into this beautiful topic. And with that being said, um, keep machine learning, I guess, and see you around on Twitter. Thank you, Jose. Bye-bye.